Section one of Celebrated Crimes, Volume four, Part one. Carl Ludwig Sant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the twenty second of March, eighteen nineteen, about nine o'clock in the morning, a young man, some twenty three or twenty four years old, wearing the dress of a German student, which consists of a short frock coat with silk braiding, tight trousers, and high boots, paused upon a little eminence that stands upon the road between Kaisertal and Mannheim, at about three quarters of the distance from the former town, and commands a view of the latter. Mannheim is seen rising calm and smiling amid gardens which once were ramparts, and which now surround and embrace it like a girdle of foliage and flowers. Having reached this spot, he lifted his cap, above the peak of which were embroidered three interlaced oak leaves in silver, and uncovering his brow, stood bareheaded for a moment to feel the fresh air that rose from the valley of the Neckar. At first sight his irregular features produced a strange impression, but before long the pallor of his face, deeply marked by smallpox, the infinite gentleness of his eyes, and the elegant framework of his long and flowing black hair which grew in an admirable curve around a broad, high forehead, attracted towards him that emotion of sad sympathy, to which we yield without inquiring its reason or dreaming of resistance. Though it was still early, he seemed already to have come some distance, for his boots were covered with dust but no doubt he was nearing his destination, for letting his cap drop, and hooking onto his belt his long pipe, that inseparable companion of the German Borsch, he drew from his pocket a little notebook, and wrote in it with a pencil. Left Vanheim at five in the morning, came in sight of Mannheim at a quarter past nine. Then putting his notebook back into his pocket, he stood motionless for a moment, his lips moving as though in mental prayer, picked up his hat, and walked on again with a firm step towards Mannheim. This young student was Karl Ludwig Sant, who was coming from Jena by way of Frankfurt and Darmstadt in order to assassinate Kotzebue. Now, as we are about to set before our readers one of those terrible actions, for the true appreciation of which the conscience is the sole judge, they must allow us to make them fully acquainted with him whom kings regarded as an assassin, judges as a fanatic, and the youth of Germany as a hero. Charles Louis Sant was born on the 5th of October, 1795, at von Siedl in the Fichtelwald. He was the youngest son of Godfrey Christopher Sand, first president and counsellor of justice to the King of Prussia, and of Dorothea Jane Wilhelmina Schaff, his wife. Besides two elder brothers, George, who entered upon a commercial career at St. Gall, and Fritz, who was an advocate in the Berlin Court of Appeal, he had an elder sister named Carolina, and a younger sister called Julia. While still in the cradle, he had been attacked by smallpox of the most malignant type. The virus having spread through all his body, laid bare his ribs, and almost ate away his skull. For several months he lay between life and death, but life at last gained the upper hand. He remained weak and sickly, however, up to his seventh year, at which time a brain fever attacked him, and again put his life in danger. As a compensation, however, this fever, when it left him, seemed to carry away with it all vestiges of his former illness. From that moment his health and strength came into existence, but during these two long illnesses his education had remained very backward, and it was not until the age of eight that he could begin his elementary studies. Moreover, his physical sufferings having retarded his intellectual development, he needed to work twice as hard as others to reach the same result. Seeing the efforts that young Zant made, even while still quite a child, to conquer the defects of his organization, Professor Salfranck, a learned and distinguished man, rector of the Hof Gymnasium College, conceived such an affection for him that, when at a later time he was appointed director of the gymnasium at Ratisbon, he could not part from his pupil and took him with him. In this town, and at the age of eleven years, he gave the first proof of his courage and humanity. One day, when he was walking with some young friends, he heard cries for help and ran in that direction. A little boy, eight or nine years old, had just fallen into a pond. Zant, immediately, without regarding his best clothes, of which, however, he was very proud, sprang into the water and, after unheard of efforts for a child of his age, succeeded in bringing the drowning boy to land. At the age of twelve or thirteen, Zant, who had become more active, skillful, and determined than many of his elders, often amused himself by giving battle to the lads of the town and of the neighboring villages. The theater of these childish conflicts, which, in their pale innocence, reflected the great battles that were at the time steeping Germany in blood, was generally a plain extending from the town of von Siedl to the mountain of St. Catharina, which had ruins at its top, and amid the ruins a tower in excellent preservation. Zant, who was one of the most eager fighters, seeing that his side had several times been defeated on account of its numerical inferiority, resolved, in order to make up for this drawback, to fortify the tower of St. Catarina, and to retire into it at the next battle, if its issue proved unfavorable to him. 
He communicated this plan to his companions, who received it with enthusiasm. A week was spent, accordingly, in collecting all possible weapons of defense in the tower and in repairing its doors and stairs. These preparations were made so secretly that the army of the enemy had no knowledge of them. Sunday came. The holidays were the days of battle. Whether because the boys were ashamed of having been beaten last time, or for some other reason, the band to which Zand belonged was even weaker than usual. Sure, however, of a means of retreat, he accepted battle notwithstanding. The struggle was not a long one, the one party was too weak in numbers to make a prolonged resistance, and began to retire in the best order that could be maintained to St. Catharina's Tower, which was reached before much damage had been felt. Having arrived there, some of the combatants ascended to the ramparts, and while the others defended themselves at the foot of the wall, began to shower stones and pebbles upon the conquerors. The latter, surprised at the new method of defense, which was now for the first time adopted, retreated a little. The rest of the defenders took advantage of the moment to retire into the fortress and shut the door. Great was the astonishment on the part of the besiegers. They had always seen that door broken down, and, lo, all at once it was presented to them a barrier which preserved the besieged from their blows. Three or four went off to find instruments with which to break it down, and meanwhile the rest of the attacking force kept the garrison blockaded. At the end of half an hour the messengers returned not only with levers and picks, but also with a considerable reinforcement composed of lads from the village to which they had been to fetch tools. Then began the assault. Sand and his companions defended themselves desperately, but it was soon evident that unless help came, the garrison would be forced to capitulate. It was proposed that they should draw lots, and that one of the besieged should be chosen, who in spite of the danger should leave the tower, make his way as best he might through the enemy's army, and go to summon the other lads of Von Zedel who had faint-heartedly remained at home. The tale of the peril in which their comrades actually were, the disgrace of a surrender which would fall upon all of them, would no doubt overcome their indolence and induce them to make a diversion that would allow the garrison to attempt sortie. This suggestion was adopted, but instead of leaving the decision to chance, Zant proposed himself as the messenger. As everybody knew his courage, his skill, and his lightness of foot, the proposition was unanimously accepted, and the new Decius prepared to execute his act of devotion. The deed was not free from danger. There were but two means of aggress, one by way of the door which would lead to the fugitives falling immediately into the hands of the enemy, the other by jumping from a rampart so high that the enemy had not set a guard there. Zond, without a moment's hesitation, went to the rampart where, always religious, even in his childish pleasures, he made a sort of prayer, then, without fear, without hesitation, with a confidence that was almost superhuman, he sprang to the ground. The distance was twenty-two feet. Sant flew instantly to Von Siedel and reached it, although the enemy had dispatched their best runners in pursuit. Then the garrison, seeing the success of their enterprise, took fresh courage and united their efforts against the besiegers, hoping everything from Zand's eloquence, which gave him a great influence over his young companions. And indeed, in half an hour he was seen reappearing at the head of some thirty boys of his own age, armed with slings and crossbows. The besiegers, on the point of being attacked before and behind, recognized the disadvantage of their position and retreated. The victory remained with Zan's party, and all the honors of the day were his. We have related this anecdote in detail, that our readers may understand from the character of the child what was that of the man. Besides, we shall see him develop, always calm and superior amid small events as amid large ones. About the same time, Zand escaped almost miraculously from two dangers. One day a hodful of plaster fell from a scaffold and broke at his feet. Another day, the Prince of Coburg, who during the King of Prussia's stay at the Baths of Alexander, was living in the house of Zand's parents, was galloping home with four horses when he came suddenly upon young Karl in a gateway. He could not escape either on the right or the left, without running the risk of being crushed between the walls and the wheels, and the coachman could not, when going at such a pace, hold in his horses. Zand flung himself on his face, and the carriage passed over him without his receiving so much as a single scratch from either the horses or the wheels. From that moment many people regarded him as predestined, and said that the hand of God was upon him. Meanwhile, political events were developing themselves around the boy, and their seriousness made him a man before the age of manhood. Napoleon weighed upon Germany like another Sennacherib. Stapps had tried to play the part of Mutius Scivola, and had died a martyr. Zand was at Hof at the time, and was a student of the gymnasium of which his good tutor Salfranc was the head. He learned that the man whom he regarded as the Antichrist was to come and review the troops in that town. He left it at once and went home to his parents, who asked him for what reason he had left the gymnasium. "'Because I could not have been in the same town with Napoleon,' he answered. 
without trying to kill him, and I do not feel my hand strong enough for that yet. This happened in 1809. Zand was fourteen years old. A peace which was signed on the 15th of October gave Germany some respite and allowed the young fanatic to resume his studies without being distracted by political considerations, but in 1811 he was occupied by them again when he learned that the gymnasium was to be dissolved and its place taken by a primary school. To this the rector Salfranc was appointed as a teacher, but instead of the thousand florins which his former appointment brought him, the new one was worth only five hundred. Carl could not remain in a primary school where he could not continue his education. He wrote to his mother to announce this event and to tell her with what equanimity the old German philosopher had borne it. Here is the answer of Zahn's mother. It will serve to show the character of the woman whose mighty heart never belied itself in the midst of the severest suffering. The answer bears the stamp of that German mysticism of which we have no idea in France. My dear Karl, you could not have given me a more grievous piece of news than that of the event which has just fallen upon your tutor and father by adoption. Nevertheless, terrible though it may be, do not doubt that he will resign himself to it, in order to give to the virtue of his pupils a great example of that submission which every subject owes to the king whom God has set over him. Furthermore, be well assured that in this world there is no other upright and well-calculated policy than that which grows out of the old precept, Honor God, be just, and fear not. And reflect also that when injustice against the worthy becomes crying, the public voice makes itself heard and uplifts those who are cast down. But if, contrary to all probability, this did not happen, if God should impose this sublime probation upon the virtue of our friend, if the world were to disown him, and providence were to become to that degree his debtor, yet in that case there are, believe me, supreme compensations. All the things and all the events that occur around us and that act upon us are but machines set in motion by a higher hand, so as to complete our education for a higher world in which alone we shall take our truer place. Apply yourself, therefore, my dear child, to watch over yourself unceasingly and always, so that you may not take great and fine isolated actions for real virtue, and may be ready every moment to do all that your duty may require of you. Fundamentally, nothing is great, you see, and nothing small. When things are looked at apart from one another, and it is only the putting of things together that produces the unity of evil or of good. Moreover, God only sends the trial to the heart where he has put strength, and the manner in which you tell me that your master has borne the misfortune that has befallen him is a fresh proof of this great and eternal truth. You must form yourself upon him, my dear child, and if you are obliged to leave Hof for Bamberg, you must resign yourself to it courageously. Man has three educations, that which he receives from his parents, that which circumstances impose upon him, and lastly that which he gives himself. If that misfortune should occur, pray to God that you may yourself worthily complete the last education, the most important of all. I will give you as an example the life and conduct of my father, of whom you have not heard very much, for he died before you were born, but whose mind and likeness are reproduced in you only among all your brothers and sisters. The disastrous fire which reduced his native town to ashes destroyed his fortune and that of his relatives. Grief at having lost everything, for the fire broke out in the next house to his, cost his father his life, and while his mother, who for six years had been stretched on a bed of pain, where horrible convulsions held her fast, supported her three little girls by the needlework that she did in the intervals of suffering. He went as a mere clerk into one of the leading mercantile houses of Augsburg, where his lively and yet even temper made him welcome. There he learned a calling, for which, however, he was not naturally adapted, and came back to the home of his birth with a pure and stainless heart, in order to be the support of his mother and his sisters. A man can do much when he wishes to do much. Join your efforts to my prayers, and leave the rest in the hands of God." The prediction of this Puritan woman was fulfilled. A little time afterwards, Rector Salfranc was appointed professor at Rickenburg. Whether Sand followed him, it was there that the events of 1813 found him. In the month of March he wrote to his mother. "'I can scarcely, dear mother, express to you how calm and happy I begin to feel, since I am permitted to believe in the enfranchisement of my country, of which I hear on every side as being so near at hand, of that country which, in my faith in God, I see beforehand free and mighty, that country for whose happiness I would undergo the greatest sufferings and even death. Take strength for this crisis. If by chance it should reach our good province, lift your eyes to the Almighty, then carry them back to the beautiful rich nature. The goodness of God, which preserved and protected so many men during the disastrous Thirty Years' War, can do and will do now what it could and did then. As for me, I believe and hope. 
Leipzig came to justify Zahn's presentiments. Then the year 1814 arrived, and he thought Germany free. On the 10th of December in the same year, he left Richembourg with this certificate from his master. Karl Sand belongs to the small number of those elect young men who are distinguished at once by the gifts of the mind and the faculties of the soul. In application and work he surpasses all his fellow students, and this fact explains his rapid progress in all the philosophical and philological sciences. In mathematics only there are still some further studies which he might pursue. The most affectionate wishes of his teacher follow him on his departure. J. A. Keen, rector and master of the first class, Uschimburg, September 15th, 1814. But it was really the parents of Zand, and in particular his mother, who had prepared the fertile soil in which his teachers had sowed the seeds of learning. Zand knew this well, for at the moment of setting out for the university at Tübingen, where he was about to complete the theological studies necessary for becoming a pastor, as he desired to do, he wrote to them. I confess, like all my brothers and sisters, I owe to you that beautiful and great part of my education, which I have seen to be lacking to the most of those around me. Heaven alone can reward you by a conviction of having so nobly and grandly fulfilled your parental duties amid many others. After having paid a visit to his brother at St. Gall, Zond reached Tübingen, to which he had been principally attracted by the reputation of Eschenmeyer. He spent that winter quietly, and no other incident befell than his admission into an association of Burschen, called the Teutonic. Then came Tester of 1815, and with it the terrible news that Napoleon had landed in the Gulf of Juan. Immediately all the youth of Germany able to bear arms gathered once more around the banners of 1813 and 1814. Zand followed the general example, but the action, which in others was an effect of enthusiasm, was in him the result of calm and deliberate resolution. He wrote to von Siedel on this occasion. April twenty second, 1813 My dear parents, until now you have found me submissive to your parental lessons and to the advice of my excellent masters. Until now I have made efforts to render myself worthy of the education that God has sent me through you, and have applied myself to become capable of spreading the word of the Lord through my native land. And for this reason I can today declare to you sincerely the decision that I have taken— assured that as tender and affectionate parents you will calm yourselves, and as German parents and patriots you will rather praise my resolution than seek to turn me from it. The country calls once more for help, and this time the call is addressed to me, too, for now I have courage and strength. It cost me a great inward struggle, believe me, to abstain when in 1813 she gave her first cry, and only the conviction held me back that thousands of others were then fighting and conquering for Germany— while I had to live for the peaceful calling to which I was destined. Now it is a question of preserving our newly re-established liberty, which in so many places has already brought in so rich a harvest. The all-powerful and merciful Lord reserves for us this great trial, which will certainly be the last. It is for us, therefore, to show that we are worthy of the supreme gift which he has given us, and capable of upholding it with strength and firmness. The danger of the country has never been so great as it is now, that is why among the youth of germany the strong should support the wavering that all may rise together our brave brothers in the north are already assembling from all parts under their banners the state of Württemberg is proclaiming a general levy and volunteers are coming in from every quarter asking to die for their country i consider it my duty too to fight for my country and for all the dear ones whom i love if i were not profoundly convinced of this truth i should not communicate my resolution to you but my family is one that has a really German heart, and that would consider me as a coward and an unworthy son if I did not follow this impulse. I certainly feel the greatness of the sacrifice. It costs me something, believe me, to leave my beautiful studies and go to put myself under the orders of vulgar, uneducated people, but this only increases my courage in going to secure the liberty of my brothers. Moreover, when once that liberty is secured, if God deigns to allow, I will return to carry them his word." I take leave, therefore, for a time of you, my most worthy parents, of my brothers, my sisters, and all who are dear to me, as after mature deliberation it seems the most suitable thing for me to serve with the Bavarians, I shall get myself enrolled for as long as the war may last with a company of that nation. Farewell, then. Live happily. Far away from you as I shall be, I shall follow your pious exhortations. In this new track I shall still, I hope, remain pure before God and I shall always try to walk in the path that rises above the things of earth and leads to those of heaven, and perhaps in this career the bliss of saving some souls from their fall may be reserved for me. Your dear image will always be about me. 
I will always have the Lord before my eyes and in my heart, so that I may endure joyfully the pains and fatigues of this holy war. Include me in your prayers. God will send you the hope of better times to help you in bearing the unhappy time in which we now are. We cannot see one another again soon unless we conquer. And if we should be conquered, which God forbid, then my last wish, which I pray you, I conjure you to fulfill, my last and supreme wish would be that you, my dear and deserving German relatives, should leave an enslaved country for some other not yet under the yoke. But why should we thus sadden one another's hearts? Is not our cause just and holy, and is not God just and holy? How then should we not be victors? You see that sometimes I doubt, so in your letters, which I am impatiently expecting, have pity on me and do not alarm my soul, for in any case we shall meet again in another country, and that one will always be free and happy. I am until death your dutiful and grateful son, Karl Sant. These two lines of Kerner's were written as a postscript. Perchance above our foemen lying dead, we may behold the star of liberty. With this farewell to his parents, and with Corner's poems on his lips, Zand gave up his books, and on the 10th of May we find him in arms among the volunteer chasseurs enrolled under the command of Major Falkenhausen, who was at that time at Mannheim, where he found his second brother who had preceded him, and they underwent all their drill together. Though Zand was not accustomed to great bodily fatigues, he endured those of the campaign with surprising strength, refusing all the alleviations that his superiors tried to offer him for he would allow no one to outdo him in the trouble that he took for the good of the country. On the march he invariably shared anything that he possessed fraternally with his comrades, helping those who were weaker than himself to carry their burdens, and at once priest and soldier, sustaining them by his words when he was powerless to do anything more. On the 18th of June, at eight o'clock in the evening, he arrived upon the field of battle at Waterloo. On the 14th of July he entered Paris. On the 18th of December, 1815, Karl Sant and his brother were back at Von Siedel, to the great joy of their family. He spent the Christmas holidays and the end of the year with them, but his ardor for his new vocation did not allow him to remain longer, and on the 7th of January he reached Erlangen. Then, to make up for lost time, he resolved to subject his day to fixed and uniform rules, and to write down every evening what he had done since the morning. It is by the help of this journal that we are able to follow the young enthusiast, not only in all the actions of his life, but also in all the thoughts of his mind and all the hesitations of his conscience. In it we find his whole self, simple to naivete, enthusiastic to madness, gentle even to weakness towards others, severe even to asceticism towards himself. One of his great griefs was the expense that his education occasioned to his parents, and every useless and costly pleasure left a remorse in his heart. Thus, on the ninth of February, 1816, he wrote, "'I meant to go and visit my parents.' Accordingly, I went to the Comas house, and there I was much amused. N and T began upon me with the everlasting jokes about von Siedel, that went on until eleven o'clock. But afterwards, N and T began to torment me to go to the wine shop. I refused as long as I could, but as at last they seemed to think that it was from contempt of them that I would not go and drink a glass of Rhine wine with them, I did not dare resist longer. Unfortunately, they did not stop at Braunberger, and while my glass was still half full, N ordered a bottle of champagne. When the first had disappeared, T ordered a second. Then, even before this second bottle was drank, both of them ordered a third in my name and in spite of me. I returned home quite giddy and threw myself upon the sofa where I slept for about an hour and only went to bed afterwards. Thus passed this shameful day, in which I have not thought enough of my kind and worthy parents, who are leading a poor and hard life, and in which I suffered myself to be led away by the example of people who have money into spending four florins an expenditure which was useless and which would have kept the whole family for two days pardon me my god pardon me i beseech thee and receive the vow that i make never to fall into the same fault again in future i will live even more abstemiously than i usually do so as to repair the fatal traces in my poor cash-box of my extravagance and not to be obliged to ask money of my mother before the day when she thinks of sending me some herself then, at the very time when the poor young man reproaches himself as if with a crime with having spent four florins, one of his cousins, a widow, dies and leaves three orphan children. He runs immediately to carry the first consolations to the unhappy little creatures, entreats his mother to take charge of the youngest, and, overjoyed at her answer, thanks her thus. For the very keen joy that you have given me by your letter, and for the very dear tone in which your soul speaks to me, bless you, O oh my mother! 
as I might have hoped and been sure, you have taken little Julius, and that fills me afresh with the deepest gratitude towards you, the rather that in my constant trust in your goodness I had already in her lifetime given our good little cousin the promise that you are fulfilling for me after her death. About March, Zant, though he did not fall ill, had an indisposition that obliged him to go and take the waters. His mother happened at the time to be at the ironworks of Redbitz, some twelve or fifteen miles from Von Siedel, where the mineral springs are found. Zand established himself there with his mother, and notwithstanding his desire to avoid interrupting his work, the time taken up by baths, by invitations to dinners, and even by the walks which his health required, disturbed the regularity of his usual existence and awakened his remorse. Thus we find these lines written in his journal for April 13th life without some high aim towards which all thoughts and actions tend is an empty desert my day yesterday is a proof of this i spent it with my own people and that of course was a great pleasure to me but how did i spend it in continual eating so that when i wanted to work i could do nothing worth doing full of indolence and slackness i dragged myself into the company of two or three sets of people and came from them in the same state of mind as i went to them for these expeditions Sand made use of a little chestnut horse which belonged to his brother, and of which he was very fond. This little horse had been bought with great difficulty, for, as we have said, the whole family was poor. The following note in relation to the animal will give an idea of Zahn's simplicity of heart. 19th April Today I have been very happy at the iron works, and very industrious beside my kind mother. In the evening I came home on the little chestnut. Since the day before yesterday, when he got a strain and hurt his foot, he has been very restive and very touchy, and when he got home he refused his food. I thought at first that he did not fancy his fodder, and gave him some pieces of sugar and sticks of cinnamon which he likes very much. He tasted them, but would not eat them. The poor little beast seems to have some other internal indisposition besides his injured foot. If by ill luck he were to become foundered or ill, everybody, even my parents, would throw the blame on me, and yet I have been very careful and considerate of him. My God, my Lord, thou who canst do things both great and small, remove from me this misfortune, and let him recover as quickly as possible. If, however, thou hast willed otherwise, and if this fresh trouble is to fall upon us, I will try to bear it with courage and as the expiation of some sin. Meanwhile, O oh my God, I leave this matter in thy hands, as I leave my life and my soul. On the 20th of April he wrote, The little horse is well, God has helped me. German manners and customs are so different from ours, and contrasts occur so frequently in the same man on the other side of the Rhine, that anything less than all the quotations which we have given would have been insufficient to place before our readers a true idea of that character made up of artlessness and reason, childishness and strength, depression and enthusiasm, material details and poetic ideas, which renders Zand a man incomprehensible to us. We will now continue the portrait, which still wants a few finishing touches. When he returned to Erlangen, after the completion of his cure, Zand read Faust for the first time. At first he was amazed at that work, which seemed to him an orgy of genius. Then, when he had entirely finished it, he reconsidered his first impression and wrote, Fourth May. Oh, horrible struggle of man and devil! What Mephistopheles is in me I feel for the first time in this hour, and I feel it, oh God, with consternation! About eleven at night I finished reading the tragedy, and I felt and saw the fiend in myself, so that by midnight, amid my tears and despair, I was at last frightened at myself. Sand was falling by degrees into a deep melancholy, from which nothing could rouse him except his desire to purify and preach morality to the students around him. To anyone who knows university life, such a task will seem superhuman. Sand, however, was not discouraged, and if he could not gain an influence over everyone, he at least succeeded in forming around him a considerable circle of the most intelligent and the best. Nevertheless, in the midst of these apostolic labors, strange longings for death would overcome him. He seemed to recall heaven and want to return to it. He called these temptations homesickness for the soul's country. His favorite authors were Lessing, Schiller, Herder, and Goethe. After rereading the two last for the twentieth time, this is what he wrote. Good and evil touch each other. The woes of the young Werther and of Eislingen's seduction are almost the same story. No matter, we must not judge between what is good and what is evil in others, for that is what God will do. I have just been spending much time over this thought, and have become convinced that in no circumstances ought we to allow ourselves to seek for the devil in others, 
and that we have no right to judge. The only creature over whom we have received the power to judge and condemn is ourself, and that gives us enough constant care, business, and trouble. I have again today felt a profound desire to quit this world and enter a higher world. But this desire is rather dejection than strength, a lassitude than an upsoaring. End of section one. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Section 2 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 4, Part 1, Carl Ludwig Zandt, by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The year 1816 was spent by Zandt in these pious attempts upon his young comrades, in this ceaseless self-examination, and in the perpetual battle which he waged with the desire for death that pursued him. Every day he had deeper doubts of himself, and on the 1st of January, 1817, he wrote this prayer in his diary. Grant to me, O Lord, to me whom thou hast endowed, in sending me on earth with free will, the grace that in this year which we are now beginning, I may never relax this constant attention, and not shamefully give up the examination of my conscience which I have hitherto made. Give me strength to increase the attention which I turn upon my own life, and to diminish that which I turn upon the life of others strengthen my will that it may become powerful to command the desires of the body and the waverings of the soul give me a pious conscience entirely devoted to thy celestial kingdom that i may always belong to thee or after failing may be able to return to thee sand was right in praying to god for the year eighteen seventeen and his fears were a presentiment the skies of germany lighted by leipzig and waterloo were once more darkened to the colossal and universal despotism of napoleon succeeded the individual oppression of those little princes who made up the germanic diet and all that the nations had gained by overthrowing the giant was to be governed by dwarfs this was the time when secret societies were organized throughout germany let us say a few words about them for the history that we are writing is not only that of individuals but also that of nations and every time that occasion presents itself we will give our little picture a wide horizon the secret societies of germany of which without knowing them we have all heard seem when we follow them up like rivers to originate in some sort of affiliation to those famous clubs of the illumines and the freemasons which made so much stir in france at the close of the eighteenth century at the time of the revolution of eighty nine these different philosophical political and religious sects enthusiastically accepted the republican doctrines and the successes of our first generals have often been attributed to the secret efforts of the members when bonaparte who was acquainted with these groups and was even said to have belonged to them exchanged his general's uniform for an emperor's cloak all of them considering him as a renegade and traitor not only rose against him at home but tried to raise enemies against him abroad as they addressed themselves to noble and generous passions they found a response and princes to whom their results might be profitable seemed for a moment to encourage them among others prince louis of prussia was grand master of one of these societies the attempted murder by Stops, to which we have already referred was one of the thunderclaps of the storm but its morrow brought the peace of vienna and the degradation of austria was the death-blow of the old germanic organization these societies which had received a mortal wound in eighteen o six and were now controlled by the french police instead of continuing to meet in public were forced to seek new members in the dark in eighteen eleven several agents of these societies were arrested in berlin but the prussian authorities following secret orders of queen louisa actually protected them so that they were easily able to deceive the french police about their intentions about february eighteen fifteen the disasters of the french army revived the courage of these societies for it was seen that god was helping their cause the students in particular joined enthusiastically in the new attempts that were now begun many colleges enrolled themselves almost entire and chose their principals and professors as captains the poet kerner killed in the eighteenth of october at leipzig was the hero of this campaign the triumph of this national movement which twice carried the prussian army largely composed of volunteers to paris was followed when the treaties of 1850 and the new Germanic constitution were made known by a terrible reaction in Germany. All these young men, who, exiled by their princes, had risen in the name of liberty, soon perceived that they had been used as tools to establish European despotism. They wished to claim the promises that had been made, but the policy of Talleyrand and uh, Metternich weighed on them, and repressing them at the first words they uttered, compelled them to shelter their discontent and their hopes in the universities. 
which enjoying a kind of constitution of their own more easily escaped the investigations made by the spies of the holy alliance but repressed as they were these societies continued nevertheless to exist and kept up communications by means of traveling students who bearing verbal messages traversed germany under the pretense of botanizing and passing from mountain to mountain so to broadcast those luminous and hopeful words of which peoples are always greedy and kings always fear we have seen that zand carried away by the general movement had gone through the campaign of eighteen fifteen as a volunteer although he was then only nineteen years old on his return he like others had found his golden hopes deceived and it is from this period that we find his journal assuming the tone of mysticism and sadness which our readers must have remarked in it he soon entered one of these associations the teutonia and from that moment regarding the great cause which he had taken up as a religious one he attempted to make the conspirators worthy of their enterprise and thus arose his attempts to inculcate moral doctrines in which he succeeded with some but failed with the majority zand had succeeded however in forming around him a certain circle of puritans composed of about sixty to eighty students all belonging to the group of the burschenschaft which continued its political and religious course despite all the jeers of the opposing group the landmannschaft one of his friends called dittmar and he were pretty much the chiefs and although no election had given them their authority they exercised so much influence upon what was decided that in any particular case their fellow adepts were sure spontaneously to obey any impulse that they might choose to impart the meetings of the burschen took place upon a little hill crowned by a ruined castle which was situated at some distance from erlangen and which zand and dittmar had called rutli in memory of the spot where walter first melchtal and stauffacher had made their vow to deliver their country there under the pretense of students games while they built up a new house with the ruined fragments they passed alternately from symbol to action and from action to symbol meanwhile the association was making such advances throughout germany that not only the kings and princes of the german confederation but also the great european powers began to be uneasy france set agents to bring home reports russia paid agents on the spot and the persecutions that touched a professor and exasperated a whole university often arose from a note sent by the cabinet of the tuileries or of st petersburg it was amid the events that began thus that zand after commending himself to the protection of god began the year eighteen seventeen in the sad mood in which we have just seen him and in which he was kept rather by a disgust for things as they were than by a disgust for life on the eighth of may preyed upon by this melancholy which he cannot conquer and which comes from the disappointment of all his political hopes he writes in his diary i shall find it impassable to set seriously to work and this idle temper this humour of hypochondria which casts its black veil over everything in life continues and grows in spite of the moral activity which i imposed on myself yesterday in the holidays fearing to burden his parents with any additional expense he will not go home and prefers to make a walking tour with his friends no doubt this tour in addition to its recreative side had a political aim be that as it may sand's diary during the period of his journey shows nothing but the names of the towns through which he passed that we may have a notion of zand's dutifulness to his parents it should be said that he did not set out until he had obtained his mother's permission on their return zand dittmar and their friends the burschen found their rutli sacked by their enemies of the landmannschaft the house that they had built was demolished and its fragments dispersed zand took this event for an omen and was greatly depressed by it it seems to me oh my god he says in his journal that everything swims and turns around me my soul grows darker and darker my moral strength grows less instead of greater i work and cannot achieve walk towards my aim and do not reach it exhaust myself and do nothing great the days of life flee one after another cares and uneasiness increase i see no haven anywhere for our sacred german cause the end will be that we shall fall for i myself waver o oh, lord and father protect me save me and lead me to that land from which we are for ever driven back by the indifference of wavering spirits about this time a terrible event struck zand to the heart his friend dittmar was drowned this is what he wrote in his diary on the very morning of the occurrence oh almighty god what is going to become of me for the last fortnight i have been drawn into disorder and have not been able to compel myself to look fixedly either backward or forward in my life so that from the fourth of june up to the present hour my journal has remained empty 
yet every day i might have had occasion to praise thee o oh my god but my soul is in anguish lord do not turn from me the more are the obstacles the more the need is there of strength in the evening he added these few words to the lines that he had written in the morning desolation despair and death over my friend over my very deeply loved ditmar this letter which he wrote to his family contains the account of the tragic event you know that when my best friends a c and z were gone i became particularly intimate with my well-beloved ditmar of ansbach ditmar that is to say a true and worthy german an evangelical christian something more in short than a man an angelic soul always turned toward the good serene pious and ready for action he had come to live in a room next to mine in professor grundler's house we loved each other upheld each other in our efforts and well or ill bear our good or evil fortune in common on this last spring evening after having worked in his room and having strengthened ourselves anew to resist all the torments of life and to advance toward the aim that we desired to attain we went about seven in the evening to the baths of redwitz a very black storm was rising in the sky but only as yet appeared on the horizon e who was with us proposed to go home but ditmar persisted saying that the canal was but a few steps away god permitted that it should not be i who replied with these fatal words so he went on the sunset was splendid i still see it its violet clouds all fringed with gold for i remember the smallest detail of that evening ditmar went down first he was the only one of us who knew how to swim so he walked before us to show us the depth the water was about up to our chests and he who preceded us was up to his shoulders when he warned us not to go farther because he was ceasing to feel the bottom he immediately gave up his footing and began to swim but scarcely had he made ten strokes when having reached the place where the river separates into two branches he uttered a cry and as he was trying to get a foothold disappeared we ran at once to the bank hoping to be able to help him more easily but we had neither poles nor ropes within reach and as i have told you neither of us could swim then we called for help with all our might at that moment ditmar reappeared and by an unheard-of effort seized the end of a willow branch that was hanging over the water but the branch was not strong enough to resist and our friend sank again as though he had been struck by apoplexy can you imagine the state in which we were we his friends bending over the river our fixed and haggard eyes trying to pierce its depth my god my god how was it we did not go mad a great crowd however had run at our cries for two hours they sought for him with boats and drag hooks and at last they succeeded in drawing his body from the gulf yesterday we bore it solemnly to the field of rest thus with the end of this spring has begun the serious summer of my life i greeted it in a grave and melancholy mood and you behold me now if not consoled at least strengthened by religion which thanks to the merits of christ gives me the assurance of my meeting with my friend in heaven from the heights of which he will inspire me with strength to support the trials of this life and now i do not desire anything more except to know you free from all anxiety in regard to me instead of serving to unite the two groups of students in a common grief this accident on the contrary did but intensify their hatred of each other among the first persons who ran up at the cries of zand and his companion was a member of the landmannschaft who could swim but instead of going to ditmar's assistance he exclaimed it seems that we shall get rid of one of these dogs of Bershen. thank god notwithstanding this manifestation of hatred which indeed might be that of an individual and not of the whole body the Bershen invited their enemies to be present at ditmar's funeral a brutal refusal and a threat to disturb the ceremony by insults to the corpse formed their sole reply the Bershen then warned the authorities who took suitable measures and all ditmar's friends followed his coffin sword in hand beholding this calm but resolute demonstration the landmannschaft did not dare to carry out their threat and contented themselves with insulting the procession by laughs and songs zand wrote in his journal ditmar has a great loss to all of us and particularly to me he gave me the overflow of his strength and life he stopped as it were with an embankment the part of my character that is irresolute and undecided from him it is that i have learned not to dread the approaching storm and to know how to fight and die some days after the funeral zand had a quarrel about ditmar with one of his former friends who had passed over from the burschen to the landmannschaft and who had made himself conspicuous at the time of the funeral by his indecent hilarity it was decided that they should fight the next day and on the same day zand wrote in his journal tomorrow i am to fight with p g 
Yet thou knowest, O oh my God, what great friends we formerly were, except for a certain mistrust with which his coldness always inspired me. But on this occasion his odious conduct has caused me to descend from the tenderest pity to the profoundest hatred. My God, do not withdraw thy hand either from him or from me, since we are both fighting like men. Judge only by our two causes, and give the victory to that which is the more just. If thou shouldst call me before thy supreme tribunal, I know very well that I should appear burdened with an eternal malediction, and indeed it is not upon myself that I reckon, but upon the merits of our Saviour Jesus Christ. Come what may, be praised and blessed, O my God. My dear parents, brothers, and friends, I commend to you the protection of God. Zond waited in vain for two hours next day. His adversary did not come to the meeting-place. The loss of Ditmar, however, by no means produced the result upon Sand that might have been expected, and that he himself seems to indicate in the regrets he expressed for him. Deprived of that strong soul upon which he rested, Zand understood that it was his task, by redoubled energy, to make the death of Ditmar less fatal to his party. And indeed he continued singly the work of drawing in recruits which they had been carrying on together, and the patriotic conspiracy was not for a moment impeded. The holidays came, and Zan left Erlangen to return no more. From von Siedel he was to proceed to Jena, in order to complete his theological studies there. After some days spent with his family, and indicated in his journal as happy, Zand went to his new place of abode, where he arrived some time before the festival of the Wattberg. This festival, established to celebrate the anniversary of the Battle of Leipzig, was regarded as a solemnity throughout Germany, and although the princes well knew that it was a centre for the annual renewal of affiliation to the various societies, they dared not forbid it. Indeed, the manifesto of the Teutonic Association was exhibited at this festival and signed by more than two thousand deputies from different universities in Germany. This was a day of joy for Zand, for he found in the midst of new friends a great number of old ones. The government, however, which had not dared to attack the association by force, resolved to undermine it by opinion. M. de Steren published a terrible document, attacking the societies and founded, it was said, upon information furnished by Kotzebue. This publication made a great stir, not only at Jena, but throughout all Germany. Here is the trace of this event that we find in Zahn's journal. 24th November Today, after working with much ease and assiduity, I went out about four with E. As we crossed the marketplace, we heard Kotzebue's new and venomous insult read. By what a fury that man is possessed against the Burschen and against all who love Germany! Thus, for the first time, and in these terms, Zahn's journal presents the name of the man who, eighteen months later, he was to slay. On the twenty-ninth in the evening, Zand writes again. Tomorrow I shall set out courageously and joyfully from this place for a pilgrimage to von Siedel. There I shall find my large-hearted mother and my tender sister Julia. There I shall cool my head and warm my heart. Probably I shall be present at my good Fritz's marriage with Louisa, and at the baptism of my very dear Dershmith's firstborn. God, O oh my father, as thou hast been with me during my sad course, be with me still on my happy road. This journey did in fact greater cheer sand. Since Ditmar's death his attacks of hypochondria had disappeared. While Ditmar lived he might die. Ditmar being dead it was his part to live. On the 11th of December he left von Siedel to return to Jena, and on the 31st of the same month he wrote this prayer in his journal. O oh, merciful Saviour! I began this year with prayer, and in these last days I have been subject to distraction and ill-disposed. When I look backward, I find, alas, that I have not become better, but I have entered more profoundly into life, and should occasion present, I now feel strength to act. It is because thou hast always been with me, Lord, even when I was not with thee. If our readers have followed with some attention the different extracts from the journal that we have placed before them, they must have seen Zahn's resolution gradually growing stronger and his brain becoming excited. From the beginning of the year 1818 one feels his view, which long was timid and wandering, taking in a wider horizon and fixing itself on a nobler aim. He is no longer ambitious of the pastor's simple life, or of the narrow influence which he might gain in a little community, and which in his juvenile modesty had seemed the height of good fortune and happiness. It is now his native land, his German people, nay, all humanity, which he embraces in his gigantic plans of political regeneration. Thus, on the fly-leaf of his journal for the year 1818, he writes, Lord, let me strengthen myself in the idea that I have conceived of the deliverance of humanity by the holy sacrifice of thy Son. 
grant that i may be a christ of germany and that like and through jesus i may be strong and patient in suffering but the anti-republican pamphlets of Kotzebue increased in number and gained a fatal influence upon the minds of rulers nearly all the persons who were attacked in these pamphlets were known and esteemed at jena and it might be easily comprehended what effects were produced by such insults upon these young heads and noble hearts which carried conviction to the point of blindness and enthusiasm to that of fanaticism thus here is what zand wrote in his diary on the fifth of may lord what causes this melancholy anguish which has again taken possession of me but a firm and constant will surmounts everything and the idea of the country gives joy and courage to the saddest and the weakest when i think of that i am always amazed that there is none among us found courageous enough to drive a knife into the breast of kotzebue or of any other traitor still dominated by the same thought he continues thus on the eighteenth of may a man is nothing in comparison with a nation he is a unity compared with millions a minute compared with a century a man who nothing precedes and nothing follows is born lives and dies in a longer or shorter time which relatively to eternity hardly equals the duration of a lightning flash a nation on the contrary is immortal from time to time however amid these thoughts that bear the impress of that political fatality which was driving him towards the deed of bloodshed the kindly and joyous youth reappears on the twenty fourth of june he writes to his mother i have received your long and beautiful letter accompanied by the very complete and well-chosen outfit which you send me the sight of this fine linen gave me back one of the joys of my childhood these are fresh benefits my prayers never remain unfulfilled and i have continual cause to thank you and god i receive all at once shirts two pairs of fine sheets a present of your work and of yulia's and carolina's work dainties and sweetmeats so that i am still jumping with joy and i turned three times on my heels when i opened the little parcel receive the thanks of my heart and share as giver in the joy of him who has received to-day however is a very serious day the last day of spring and the anniversary of that on which i lost my noble and good ditmar i am a prey to a thousand different and confused feelings but i have only two passions left in me which remain upright and like two pillars of brass support this whole chaos the thought of god and the love of my country during all this time zan's life remains apparently calm and equal the inward storm is calmed he rejoices in his application to work and his cheerful temper however from time to time he makes great complaints to himself of his propensity to love dainty food which he does not always find it possible to conquer then in his self-contempt he calls himself fig stomach or cake stomach but amid all this the religious and political exaltation and visits all the battlefields near to the road that he follows on the eighteenth of october he is back at jena where he resumes his studies with more application than ever it is among such university studies that the year eighteen eighteen closes for him and we should hardly suspect the terrible resolution which he has taken were it not that we find in his journal this last note dated the thirty first of december i finished the last day of this year eighteen eighteen then in a serious and solemn mood and i have decided that the christmas feast which has just gone by will be the last christmas feast that i shall celebrate if anything is to come of our efforts if the cause of humanity is to assume the upper hand in our country if in this faithless epoch any noble feelings can spring up afresh and make way it can only happen if the wretch the traitor the seducer of youth the infamous cuts of you falls i am fully convinced of this and until i have accomplished the work upon which i have resolved i shall have no rest lord thou who knowest that i have devoted my life to this great action i only need now that it is fixed in my mind to beg of thee true firmness and courage of soul here zan's diary ends he had begun it to strengthen himself he had reached his aim he needed nothing more from this moment he was occupied by nothing but this single idea and he continued slowly to mature the plan in his head in order to familiarize himself with its execution but all the impressions arising from this thought remained in his own mind and none was manifested on the surface to everyone else he was the same but for some little time past a complete and unaltered serenity accompanied by a visible and cheerful return of inclination towards life had been noticed in him he had made no change in the hours or the duration of his studies but he had begun to attend the anatomical classes very assiduously one day he was seen to give even more than his customary attention to a lesson in which the professor was demonstrating the various function of the heart he examined with the greatest care the place occupied by it in the chest asking to have some of the demonstrations repeated two or three times 
and when he went out, questioning some of the young men who were following the medical courses about the susceptibility of the organ which cannot receive ever so slight a blow without death ensuing from that blow. All this with so perfect an indifference and calmness that no one about him conceived any suspicion. Another day, A.S., one of his friends, came into his room. Zand, who had heard him coming up, was standing by the table with a paper knife in his hand, waiting for him. Directly the visitor came in, Zand flung himself upon him, struck him lightly on the forehead, and then, as he put up his hands to ward off the blow, struck him rather more violently in the chest. Then, satisfied with this experiment, said, "'You see, when you want to kill a man, that is the way to do it. You threaten the face. He puts up his hands, and while he does so, you thrust the dagger into his heart.' The two young men laughed heartily over this murderous demonstration, and A.S. related it that evening at the wine-shop as one of the peculiarities of character that were common in his friend. After the event, the pantomime explained itself. The month of March arrived. Zand became day by day calmer, more affectionate and kinder. It might be thought that in the moment of leaving his friends forever, he wished to leave them an ineffaceable remembrance of him. At last he announced that, on account of several family affairs, he was about to undertake a little journey, and set about all his preparations with his usual care, but with a serenity never previously seen in him. Up to that time he had continued to work as usual, not relaxing for an instant, for there was a possibility that Kotzebue might die or be killed by somebody else before the term that San had fixed to himself, and in that case he did not wish to have lost time. On the 7th of March he invited all his friends to spend the evening with him, and announced his departure for the next day but one, the ninth. All of them then proposed to him to escort him for some leagues, but Zant refused. He feared lest this demonstration, innocent though it were, might compromise them later on. He set forth alone, therefore, after having hired his lodgings for another half-year, in order to obviate any suspicion, and went by way of Erfurt and Eisenach, in order to visit the Wartburg. From that place he went to Frankfurt, where he slept on the 17th and on the morrow he continued his journey by way of Darmstadt. At last, on the 23rd, at nine in the morning, he arrived at the top of the little hill, where we found him at the beginning of this narrative. Throughout the journey he had been the amiable and happy young man whom no one could see without liking. Having reached Mannheim, he took a room at the Weinberg and wrote his name as Henry in the visitor's list. He immediately inquired where Kotzebue lived. The counsellor dwelt near the church of the Jesuits, his house was at the corner of a street, and though Zahn's informants could not tell him exactly the letter, they assured him it was not possible to mistake the house. At Mannheim, houses are marked by letters, not by numbers. Zahn went at once to Kotzebue's house. It was about ten o'clock. He was told that the counsellor had went on a walk for an hour or two every morning in the park of Mannheim. Zahn inquired about the path in which he generally walked and about the clothes he wore, for never having seen him he could only recognize him by the description. Kotzebue chanced to take another path. Zand walked about the park for an hour, but seeing no one who corresponded to the description given him, went back to the house. Kotzebue had come in, but was at breakfast and could not see him. Zand went back to the Weinberg and sat down to the midday table d'hote, where he dined with an appearance of such calmness and even of such happiness, that his conversation, which was now lively, and now simple, and now dignified, was remarked by everybody. At five in the afternoon he returned a third time to the house of Kotzbier, who was giving a great dinner that day, but orders had been given to admit Zand. He was shown into a little room opening out of the anteroom, and a moment after Kotzbier came in. Zand then performed the drama which he had rehearsed upon his friend A.S. Kotzebue, finding his face threatened, put his hands up to it, and left his breast exposed. Zand at once stabbed him to the heart. Kotzebue gave one cry, staggered, and fell back into an armchair. He was dead. At the cry, a little girl of six years old ran in, one of those charming German children with the faces of cherubs, blue-eyed with long flowing hair. She flung herself upon the body of Kotzebue, calling her father with piercing cries. Zand, standing at the door, could not endure this sight, and without going farther he thrust the dagger still covered with Kotzebue's blood up to the hilt into his own breast. Then, seeing to his surprise that notwithstanding the terrible wound he had just given himself, he did not feel the approach of death, and not wishing to fall alive into the hands of the servants who were running in, he rushed to the staircase. The persons who were invited were just coming in. They, seeing a young man, pale and bleeding, with a knife in his breast, uttered loud cries and stood aside instead of stopping him. Zand therefore passed down the staircase and reached the street below. 
Ten paces off, a patrol was passing, on the way to relieve the sentinels at the castle. Zand thought these men had been summoned by the cries that followed him. He threw himself on his knees in the middle of the street and said, "'Father, receive my soul!' Then, drawing the knife from the wound, he gave himself a second blow below the former and fell insensible. Zand was carried to the hospital and guarded with the utmost strictness. The wounds were serious, but thanks to the skill of the physicians who were called in were not mortal. One of them even healed eventually, but as to the second, the blade having gone between the costal pleura and the pulmonary pleura, an effusion of blood occurred between the two layers, so that instead of closing the wound it was kept carefully open, in order that the blood extravasated during the night might be drawn off every morning by means of a pump, as is done in the operation for epiamia. Notwithstanding these cares, Zand was for three months between life and death. End of section two. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia.